What's up, my friend? Welcome to the Finding Direction podcast. My name is Stu Massengill, and I'm here every single week to bring you a passionate guest or message dedicated to helping you find your purpose so that you can live a life full of passion, fulfillment, and happiness. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for hanging out with me, and let's dive in. What's up, my friend? Welcome back to another episode here on Finding Direction. I am pumped, as always, to dive into you with this week's conversation. I sit down with Dr. Rebecca Heiss, and this is one uh, that if you are someone who stresses out or you have some fear in your life, uh, this is going to be an episode that is going to light you up. Uh, To give you a little bit of Dr. Rebecca's background, she is an evolutionary biologist and a stressed physiologist. Uh, quite a mouthful, and she helps people live more fearless lives uh, through her deep understanding of how evolution has shaped our brains in a less than optimal fashion, we could say. Uh, Dr. Heiss breaks down the barriers that hold us back and helps us to live lives of meaning and purpose by playing in an all-in mentality even when we are afraid. Uh, Dr. Heiss, she teaches audiences how to use stress as a tool of empowerment how to embrace our worthiness and recognize the power we all have to change our brains, our behaviors, and our outcomes to exceed what we thought was possible. Uh, She is also the author of the book Instinct. And on this episode, a few things we dive into is what is stress really? Um, How can you start to use it as a positive force in your life? We talk about the evolutionary biology uh, and how it's really sort of held you back in your life. And we also talk about the relationship between stress and living a purposeful life. Uh, This is something that I just thought was such an awesome thing Rebecca shared with us. So uh, there's going to be so much on this episode, I promise you. If you have not yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can join us every single week on this show. And without further ado, here we go. Dr. Rebecca Heiss, welcome to the show. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh, man. Thank you for having me, Stu. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. And so as we kick this thing off, um, I would love it if you could give our listener just kind of a real short background as far as like, who is Rebecca? What do you do? And um, just give us like a a, a Spark Notes. Yeah, Spark Notes version is that I have a PhD in stress physiology, which means I study the hormones in the brain and why we make terrible decisions and and (laughs) screw up a lot when we're under stress. Um, And my background, I have, you know, I got a master's degree in ornithology, which is kind of weird. I'm a bird nerd. Uh, That's kind of fun. And uh, my the rest of my degrees are in biology. So I'm I'm a deep science nerd, Uh, lots of education. Um, background, but but really, what I love to do is help people, right? And yeah. so I was in academia. I now am a keynote speaker, and um, and I have a blast helping people transform their fears into rocket fuel that they can actually use for themselves. Well, That's what I do now. Of, heck yeah, yeah, that sounds like a blast. <laughs> so if if we dive into that a little bit, I'm curious for you. You know, as you've t- done a lot of work in stress physiology, is how you said it. Yeah, you nailed it. Yep. What would you say are like some of the biggest misconceptions people have around stress? Because (laughs) I think, you know, oftentimes people hear stress and it's not like, you know, you hear like lollipop and people are like, oh, they put like a smile on their face. They're like, lollipops are good, (laughs) right? It like tastes good. People hear stress and they're more prone to like frown or tense up rather than be like, ooh, excitement. So like from all the studies you've done in this, and I think it's so interesting, especially because you have like this biological look at it. Um like yeah. what are some of the misconceptions people have just around stress in general? First of all, thank you so much for asking that question because I love the association you made there, right? When most people hear stress, they're like, oh, gross, yeah. it's terrible, that's a bad thing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Having zero stress is a dead person's goal, right? Like you, you need stress. Stress is actually really good for you. You don't get out of bed in the morning without a little bit of stress. Yeah. So when we talk about stress, I often, I ask people to envision kind of an upside down U, a normal curve, if you will. If you have yeah. no stress, you also have no performance, all right? You think of your trust fund baby, right? Like often yeah. those people get into trouble because they have no need to perform. They have no real drive, no real 
For sure. anything that they need to do, right? So as stress increases to a point, so does performance. And then what most people think about when they think about stress is that distress, the bad yeah. stress, right? Yeah. On the other side of that U-shaped curve. But we forget there's a whole first part of that curve where U-stress or good stress right. actually help us to, helps us to perform at our greatest, right? And, and the greatest performers, athletes, CEOs, leaders, um, what they do is they take that U-stress, they take the distress and they transform it into good stress, stress they can use, mm. right? It's why you see records being broken in the Olympics. Like talk about high pressure, high stress. That's yeah. where you break. That's where you have the highest level of performance if you know how to set your mind up, right? You don't mm. break records in practice. You break it with the highest level of stress. Yeah. So I think the first biggest misconception is that stress is bad. It's actually really good for you. You just have to think about it in a proper way. Okay. So how does someone then find this, like not too much stress, not, not enough stress? <laughs> like how does someone find yeah. the sweet spot? That happy medium sweet spot. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, this is really hard because it's super individualized. Um, so I would love to just say, okay, everybody prick your finger and <laughs> yeah. show me how much cortisol you have, you know, and like, all right, you're in the zone. Yeah. But the, the easiest answer to this is actually, it's entirely right here between your, between your ears. So it's how we interpret the stress. So let's say, you know, you're a little bit stressed out. So you're having a, a, a tough week at work and you're feeling all that stress come up. You have a choice because your body mm -hmm. produces the exact, the exact kind of hormones and, and. Uh, neurotransmitters and chemicals when it's excited as it does when it's stressed out. So the mm. choice you have to make is, is this going to be a stress is enhancing moment, right? Can I use all of this energy that my body is putting forward to say, oh, okay, let me use this to perform. Or is this a stress is distressing, right? It's, a, it's, it's actually causing my, my yeah. performance to go down. And that interpretation lies between your ears, right? In your brain. So we're having the same biological response. The only difference is how are we interpreting stress? So we talk a lot about stress mindsets, right? Is this an adventure or is this an ordeal? And so frequently when people go into this mode of stress, they're like, oh my gosh, this is an ordeal. I'll never get this done. Things, And they start talking negatively. And that reinforces the behaviors, yeah. uh, reinforces the physiology and reinforces the outcomes. But there's all kinds of really interesting science that that shows that demonstrates right if you change the way you think and you change the way you speak and you change the way yeah. you actually have your physiology come up and when you do that it changes your results it changes your outcome so i i think so much of it is just right between the ears how are we yeah. interpreting that signal okay so it's building essentially a different relationship with stress and one thing that's yeah. interesting actually and this is like just kind of a perfect place I think to talk about this is obviously you have your book instinct, right? And a mm -hmm. lot of what it talks about, right, is we have these sort of ancestral evolutionary instincts that have basically built this reaction into us, right? When stress comes up, it's because of some of the evolution we have that now we have a bad relationship with stress. So it's, yeah. it's deeper than just saying, let me change my relationship. It's like you have your grandma, your great grandma, your great, great, great grandma, <laughs> right? It's like all the way back to like your caveman, cave dad, woman, or parents or whatever. Yeah. It's man. like yeah. coming from there. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh my gosh. Yes. So this is, this is often like we talk about evolved trauma or, or, um, generational trauma that gets mm. passed on through generations. So Robert Sapolsky, who is one of the godfathers, I would say, of stress research, he's an incredible researcher. Huh. I'm going to butcher his quote, but he eventually, he, he basically says that stress is meant for three minutes of screaming terror across the savannah. And then it should be over because either you're dead or you've escaped the, the stressor, right? Huh. So that's what our stress response is built for, for these ancestral times when you're like running away from tigers, lions, and bears, oh my. Right. Yeah. But it's not built for the pings, the dings, the social media, the interactions that we're like dealing with constantly that are actually causing us stress because we think about it. So ironically, our brains are the things that get us into trouble because we are so smart. We're actually the only 
uh, I wouldn't say the only primates, do, several primates do this, but mm -hmm. we're one of the only species that really gets in trouble with stress because we think about it and then we create more stress for ourselves. Hmm. So there was an interesting, um, there's an interesting study as we're talking about, you know, passing trauma on to, yeah. to different generations. One of my favorite studies took male mice and they created an association with this smell, this cherry blossom scent and an electrical shock. All right. So pretty negative association, classical conditioning, right? They spray the cherry yeah. blossom and then they shock them. All right. So very soon after you can spray the cherry blossom scent and these mice would shiver, right? They'd yeah, shake, they'd, they'd display yeah. all these fear behaviors, right? Their cortisol levels would go through the roof. They took these male mice and they bred them to female mice who had never seen the cherry blossom or the shocks or anything like this. And then the pups, the offspring, they tested with the cherry blossom scent. And guess what? Those offspring shook in terror as if this, this had been transmitted to them through the male Jeez. sperm line, which is crazy, right? It's, it's absolutely yeah. wild. But this is, this is known as epigenetic transmittance, right? So something in the environment shapes the DNA, well, the outside of the DNA technically, yeah. that transfers then to the next generation and the generation after that as well. And so when you start Jeez. to think about stress or stressors or, or the way yeah. our environment affects us, like this could be going back for generations. And what I think is most interesting about this when we apply it to humans is that we're not only the ones that are receiving the shock, we're also the ones that are often giving it to ourselves. Yeah. Right? Because we're thinking about the things that might go wrong. And so we're actually adding to this stressor or adding to this, this shock to our system when we don't need to be. Yeah. So I think there's, there's some hope in that message too. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting point too. It's like, if you are a parent listening to this podcast, or if you plan to have kids one day, it's just like a super important thing to pay attention to because you want to start to understand like, if you have, whether it's stress that you have like a negative relationship with or other bad mm -hmm. patterns or habits you have in your life, your DNA is literally going to pass it to your offspring. It's, it's just such a, you know, they say like sometimes in life we don't change until we have enough leverage. And I see mm -hmm. this as like a beautiful point to say like maybe for some of us, this is the leverage we need to stop letting stress have such an impact on our life because it's like it's not just your life. It's your kid's life. It's your grandkid's life. It's I mean, it's a yeah. lot. maybe even it passes on to your dogs yeah. and cats. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stu, honestly, it's, it's interesting that you say that. I have two comments on that. One, I, I remember... I was probably 35 ish at the time. I, I was married for a couple of years and, and I, I had this moment where I thought I was pregnant and Stu, oh my gosh, I like, I set down my coffee cup and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to change everything about my life. I have to start meditating. I have to get better sleep habits. I have to eat better. I have to do like all of these things. Right. Cause yeah. I don't want to be the cause of all this trauma. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Full stop. One, you're never going to stop all the trauma, right? You're yeah. never going to get it all right. So parents first thing, forgive yourself. There. But Love secondly, that. even even if you are planning to have kids or if you're not planning to have kids, why wouldn't you do all of those things for yourself? Mm. I think so often like we need the excuse of, oh, I've got to do this for the next generation. Why not do it for you? Like you are worthy enough to have those changes yeah. and to implement those changes, even if you're not having kids. So, yeah, I appreciate the point. Maybe this is the impetus, right? Yeah. But you know, also do it for yourself. You are yeah. worthy enough as it is. Yeah, yeah. Very, very true. So what are then like, do you have any tools or things that you use or you teach people when you're speaking on stage as far as like when stress pops up, here's like just a real tangible thing that <laughs> someone could do as far. And I know it may be more individualized, but like kind of at a large overview, is there anything people can start to do when stress pops up to go, okay, Dr. Heiss was mentioning this it stresses here. I need to, I need to implement this, this thing. Like, is there anything that we could use like that? Yeah, sure. There's, I, I talk about sort of recalibrating, reframing and realigning to our stress responses. So the first bit is recalibrating our stress response. And, and a lot of that is the pre-work that we have to do. So recalibrating means, you know, Sue, I'm, I'm on this, this podcast with you and what your listeners don't know is, uh, you know, we, we decided we we're going to do this in like, I don't know, two hours ago or something. And so I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling a little unprepared and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And that for me was what I would call a, a fearless challenge or a discomfort challenge. Mm -hmm. It's, you know what, what's the worst thing that happens? 
the worst thing that happens, and I can write it out, you know, the worst thing that happens is this. Okay, well, what's yeah. the best thing that happens? Well, the best thing that happens is this. So recalibrating is often as simple as asking, is it a tiger? Because <laughs> if it's not a tiger, right, if you're not going to kill and eat me, Stu, then <laughs> yeah. okay, we're alive, yeah. to, we're going to survive to the next day. And our stress response in that moment, that fight, flight, freeze response that we're experiencing, yeah. isn't actually going to help us in any of those situations. So if it's not a tiger, great, you're okay. You can start to then reframe. So yeah. we recalibrate. Now we get to reframe the response. And reframing the response means, oh, you know what? If it's not a tiger, then all of this energy, all of this nervousness, I can use this to my advantage by knowing that that blood that's now pumping through my veins faster because my heart is beating faster is going to yeah. help me think better, better thoughts, right? Because yeah. it's going to my brain. It's going to like bring glucose to the places that I need it. And so just reframing it then allows us to, to deal with that stress better. Yeah. Um, I, I skipped over one important part on recalibrating. Okay. I, I really want to challenge people to, to challenge themselves. And I know you all have heard like, get out of your comfort zone, you know, yeah. <laughs> do one thing a day that scares you. Thank you, Eleanor Roosevelt. But like one day, one thing a day, man, that's a lot. Uh, yeah. Even one thing a month, one thing a week, <laughs> what you're that's doing right. there is, is something called stress inoculation. When you go out and you do something intentionally that stretches you, right? Yeah. You're inoculating yourself against stress because you're telling yourself stories ahead of time of what's going to happen. It's like, oh, this is going to be bad. I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to, right? And then you go and do the thing and nothing bad happens. Yeah. And your brain records this as a success. It's like, oh, cool. All right, nothing bad happened. And then tomorrow when you go and do something else or the next month, your brain records the same thing. It's like, ah, oh, nothing bad happens. So you're starting to stretch and, and inoculate yourself against the stress. So when it finds you and you're not actively seeking it, Right. You don't immediately go to that distress. You're like, oh, I've got all of these stories back in my in my brain of, of feeling this before where nothing bad happened before, right? Yeah. And then the, <laughs> the last piece, I guess, is, is realigning. Um, and realigning with stress is this. I want you to think, Stu, about something that you're really proud of, some major accomplishment. Listeners out there, think of the same thing, some big thing that you've accomplished, right? Now go back in time to when you were in the middle of that project. How stressed were you? Yeah, it's definitely feeling right? some stress. Yeah, yeah, right? And this is this is what we find in all of the research. Like scale of one to 100, people are like, well, I was like a thousand. I was super stressed out in those moments. Yeah. Great. So what that means then, if you're feeling stress, this is something that's important to you. And people that, that have um, indicated that they have high stress or high anxiety or worry a lot tend to have more meaningful, more fulfilled, more purposeful lives. Hmm. So... This again is just a realignment and going, huh, stress. Hmm, good. I'm doing something meaningful. Yeah. And can you tell us more about that with um, how like more purpose aligns with more stress? Yeah. So this research, um, gosh, I, I, I'll have to go back and, and read the paper now because you put me on the spot. And I'm like, <laughs> I hope I can remember this paper. But it was a fairly robust yeah. study, like looking at 30,000 plus people and asking them on all of these various conditions, like what uh, different, different, getting different measures of stress from them. And what yeah. it showed, again, is this, this very tight link between having high levels of stress and, and feeling like they served a, a meaningful, purposeful life. And I think, again, that, that calibrates really, really nicely with our stress yeah. curve. Like if you have no stress, like what are you actually doing with your life? Is it, yeah. you know, is it, is it purposeful? Yeah. Is it meaningful? Probably not. So yeah, push, push yourself a little bit, push yourself a little bit. Nobody, I mean, listen, the, the biggest thing we hear on, on deathbeds are about the regrets, the cost of the inactions, yeah. right? It's what you didn't do. So when you're in that space of going, oh, I might fail, I might be rejected. I might this, if I do that, so what do it. The costs yeah. of actions are, are super overrated in our brain. The cost of inaction, <laughs> so true. like cost of inaction, we, we hardly even think about. Yeah. But I think that bears a lot more weight um, down the line. So yeah, yeah. I would I would challenge people to 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 be daring enough to fail rather yeah. than failing to dare. I love it. And what would you say is the relationship between stress and fear? Because it seems as you're talking, it's almost like mm. one and the same. 
is, is sort of what it's yeah like. i so, mean i guess yeah. i guess i don't i don't differentiate too much i mean i, I often will use them interchangeably stress you know from a scientist's perspective I uh, stress I measure it with cortisol, right? Your blood, your spit. Yeah. I mean, you can measure it in other bodily fluids, right? <laughs> yeah. But st- stress is really like what is the burden that you're putting on your body? I think fear is the interpretation, right? Like how are we actually interpreting this moment? And so mm. when we are in stress, when we are in fear, what what can we do to move through it? What can we do to to recalibrate, to reframe and to to realign? Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. To I fear a little bit less, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, and it, and it is true. Like, I mean, it's so interesting. Like when I was thinking about the the big thing I've achieved in my life and you're talking about it, it was like, yeah, it was stressful. It was also fearful. And you're kind of in that like that chaotic storm almost of like, like I heard someone <laughs> yeah. recently and they were talking about, you know, life's like kind of like a roller coaster, right? It's like you have the ups, the downs, you're flying and it's crazy. And you get to the end and you're like, holy crap, let's do it again. Right. And it's like, yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. very similar with what you're saying with the stress and the yeah. fear. And you're like, holy crap, I don't know how it's going to turn out. It's going to be crazy. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's like any good movie, right? It's like you get to the end of the movie and you're like, that was a good movie because there was so much chaos and it's, it's such Action a and fun. And yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I use a roller coaster in my slides a lot to, to exemplify let's this, go. right? Like you don't get to control, you don't get to control those ups and downs. Sometimes they're <laughs> yeah. outside of your control. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so often I think that's where we create the most stress in our lives because we're yeah. like, oh, my gosh, love me, love me, love me, love me, you know, or um, oh, not COVID. Gosh, I don't want COVID. like you don't get to control <laughs> yeah. so much of it, but yeah. you do get to control your reactions to it. Right. You can yeah, spend that whole roller true. coaster ride going, no, right. Or you can have <laughs> <Yeah>. it like <laughs> that's the we get to have is, is we truly get that, that choice of. Do I want to be having this adventure in life or do I want to create an ordeal out of all the things that I can't control? Yeah. The more we can let go, like, and I love the analogy of a roller coaster too. This just occurred to me that like, you literally are letting go, like, woo, yeah. hands up. Yeah. The more you do that, the more fun you're going to have, the more yeah. meaningful a life you might be, you might, you might have. Yeah. That's so cool. I love the idea too of just <laughs> looking at it like, is this an ordeal or is it an adventure, right? It's a really easy Wait, like when stress yeah. comes in, you go, am I going to make it an ordeal? Am I going to make it an adventure? And it, 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 again, it's the same stress, right? It's the same thing, but it's like you said, that mindset shift of how are you going to take it as an ordeal or an adventure? That's it, Stu. And I mean, like cur- one of the cool things too about the way our brain works is that curiosity and fear cannot coexist. So when mm. you get curious, even asking the question like, is it a tiger or can this be an adventure? When we do that, we kick our brain out of fear mode and into this curiosity space. Um, it, the reason for that yeah. is literally like for 200,000 plus years in our evolution, nobody ever had a tiger charging them and went like, huh, <laughs> I wa- you know, I wonder how fast it's coming. <laughs> like, yeah. like, that doesn't, that yeah. doesn't happen, run. Yeah. right? So if you exactly run or freeze or whatever it is you're going to do. But if you can take that moment to just get curious, you kick yourself out of that fear mode into an adventure. Interesting. So, so if we have, let's say someone that, you know, when fear or stress shows up, rather than run, they shut down or they Mm -hmm. freeze. Is it the Mm -hmm. same type of approach where they should let curiosity lead them? Is it the same type of approach where they should look at it in his venture? Or is it different if someone isn't like running, but they're, they're like, let me, let me freeze or let me retreat. Yeah. So two points to be made there. Um, the freeze response, I'm super, super glad you, you brought that up because the freeze response, just like the fight response, just like the flight response, it's physiological. So we don't get to, unfortunately, choose our response. And mm. to an extreme, right, if you're freezing in, um, in an actual threat response, like yeah. very typically people freeze in, in sexual assaults. Um, like that's a, that's a very common freeze response to have. Mm. But if your freeze response is, say, procrastination, then yeah, you can use that curiosity again to, to help you kick out of that. So, so the important point that I want to make here is that if you are in a fight response or a freeze response or a flee response, like actively in it, there's no amount of curiosity that's going to help you kick out because, <laughs> because you're in that physiology, right? So, okay. so let go of the blame and shame there. 
But if you're feeling yourself shut down, if you're feeling yourself run away, if you're in that like starting mode, right? You're typing that testy email, that fight response comes out. That's when curiosity could be a huge tool because, because then what you're doing, like if you're procrastinating, you're starting to slip into that freeze response, right? You can say, okay, what's the smallest thing that I can do? What's the smallest thing that I can do that moves me in any direction forward? Yeah. Or just in any direction, right? Like literally any direction. Because what it does is we break down and like we've all heard the the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? But if we break these goals down into the smallest possible thing, what it does is it gives our biology, our our physiology, a dopamine hit. Hmm. And we get dopamine when we accomplish some small task like checking our email, which is why we check our email all the time, right? You're like, ooh, yeah, dopamine yeah. hit, that feels good. I did something, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we can get those dopamine hits again and again and again and again, it's an addiction hormone. It feels good. We're like, oh, good, I'm getting there. So if you can begin by just taking that smallest step forward, make a list. This is what I need to do. Take yeah. the, the first piece off that list. Ooh, that felt good. Yeah. Then you start to get into that flow. And I think so often the hardest thing about these larger projects or these these responses that we get into as a result um, is that taking that first step. So curiosity yeah. can help you get there. I love it. And I think an interesting thing I just want to add there too is it's like when it does pop up the stress, even questioning it, right? Like why mm. why does this make me feel stressed? Why does this make yeah. me have some fear come up? Like, And if you peel a few layers back on that, I think it'll get you a lot of clarity as far as maybe it can wipe the fear away. Maybe it can turn it into an adventure. Right. But if you start to question like what, like rather than just have it shut you down, be like, why, why is this shutting me down? Right. And if you let curiosity lead you in that rabbit hole, I think similarly, it'll allow you to start to make that progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Ask the questions and then have a bias towards action. Right. What would happen if, Mm, what would happen if, then you start to actually make adjustments rather than sitting in one spot stuck yeah heck yeah so if we turn the page a little bit and go to your story um i'm curious you know at at what point did you kind of realize wow this stress thing is is really interesting um it's something i want (laughs) to like pursue with my life i mean did you were you seven years old and say (laughs) i love stress or you know kind of how did how did you get there yeah, that's a great question. This too, the the funny story is that I I always wanted to be an actress. I always wanted to be on stage huh. in the theater, like, but it wasn't safe, right? And you know, I was really good at academia, and so I hmm. stuck to the thing that I was good at, that I was that was right. safe, that was solid, that was easy, and um, and I just kept going to school because of that. Honestly, you know, I fell into. Um, studying West Nile virus. And so I fell into studying crows, world renowned crow expert right here. In case anybody has <laughs> crow questions later, like those birds that everybody hates, <laughs> those are my go. babies. Um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, and so like, I just fell into, fell into, fell into, fell into. And, um, and that's how I started studying stress. Actually, I started studying stress through crows initially using birds as a, as a model oh, because I, I thought it was really interesting Yeah, that birds in cities um, were really super stressed out and birds in the rural areas were not. And since they're human commensal, I was like, oh, I bet we could use these birds as like a way to study humans. Huh. Anyway, so like long story short, I ended up doing all of this research and collecting all these degrees. And um, I'm, you know, I'm married. I've got the house. I've got this academic career. Like I'm kind of at this pinnacle. Yeah. And my sister, um, my sister's wife, unfortunately, my sister-in-law, I uh, was diagnosed with di- with terminal cancer and she and I had been close, you know, she'd been my sister for 20 years. Yeah. And it was one of those moments that like rips the rug out from underneath you. Right? I know, I know sure. you know this, right? Yeah. And so I looked at my life and I was like, damn, you know, if that had been my diagnosis, frankly, I'd be pissed at the life that I led because all of my decisions had been made out of fear. Well, this is yeah. safe. This is, this is, I'm good at this. I'll just keep doing this. And um, I quit my job, sold my house, and divorced my husband in a month, which 
is not the takeaway I want your listeners to hear, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. don't, maybe that's the right decision for you. It was, it was yeah. a super stressful decision for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to like play it off like it was some fairy tale. Like I, I, the day I sold my house was the day I realized that I actually didn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> you know, it was, I, I had not yeah. made great decisions, but I was determined from that moment on to stop living in fear and to mm. not let any of my decisions be made out of fear from then on. Mm. Um, and so that's, that's really how I started taking all of the research, all of the background that I had in stress and applying it to helping people first, like myself. Like I was in that yeah. moment of needing leadership, of needing somebody to take me by the hand and say, here's how you get through this. Um, and it, you know, it, it's absolutely a calling for me. I get to yeah. be on stage. I get to be talking with cool people like you and your audience and, and delivering all of this knowledge in a way that, that feels really, um, really satisfying to me so yeah and still stressful that, by the way which means i'm doing something important i think yeah, yeah that's so cool and i think kind of two things from that it's like just when you said it in the idea of like living a life that's not run by fear versus living a life mm -hmm. that's run by fear like what went off in my head is just like two entirely different worlds that that can happen right and it's such a yeah. Like, again, we referenced the deathbed, um, you know, when people die, one of the big regrets again yeah. they have is that they didn't try, right? That that it's like, it wasn't an oops, <laughs> it was a, oh, I never did that thing, right? It's like, they don't I regret the things have, they yeah. did, they regret the things they didn't yeah. do. And I think that sits in that same aisle as far as like living a life led by fear or not led by fear. And mm -hmm. I think it's such a... I just think for anybody listening, um, even myself and taking notes, it's like, wow, that's that can change your whole life. If you say, I'm not going to live a life yeah. led by fear, I'm going to live a life that's that's not fear. Fear less. I mean, like parentheses around the less, but we can, we can talk about that. I mean, I think to yeah. me, one of the more powerful reckonings that I had is is realizing that I, I, I truly believe that every stressful moment is an opportunity to either build yourself like mm. lean into the authentic you or betray yourself. Mm. And when we live a life in fear, which most of us do most of the time, and that's not a blame, that's not a finger pointing, that's not like, I'm not trying to shame anybody. Yeah, that's just yeah. the easy path. Right? Yeah, that's sure. the easy path. Um, and then we all end up on deathbeds going, why didn't I? Gosh, I should have, I wish I would right? Um, why don't you choose to build yourself? Why don't you choose to lean into that fear to say, I don't know how this is going to go, but... <laughs> You know, what's, what's the worst thing that happened? I'm not, I'm not going to get eaten by a tiger today. Like that's, that's pretty yeah. empowering. Um, yeah. and it, it makes for a heck of an adventure on that roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the analogy that's popping in my head is like hands in the air when you're going down the roller coaster, Woo! just <laughs> let go and, and, yeah. and see where it goes. And I, I'm curious for you, was there a moment in your life when you, you could think back to where you went, man, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, do you, do you have a moment like that that you can think of? You know, uh, yeah, I've got about a, a million of them. Um, yeah. but I think the, the most powerful one recently, it's just, this is a funny one. Cause I, it, you know, I, I get to speak to audiences of, of thousands of people and, and yeah. these big leaders and names that are like important, right. Quote, putting my air quotes here, important. Yeah. And probably my favorite interaction that I've had, for the last several years was a couple months ago, I did a like a 15 and under boys, like basketball, elite basketball program. Um, mm. One of the parents had seen me and was like, hey, you know, you're in Charlotte, our boys are having a tough, tough go. Would you just come in and give them a little pep talk? And I'm oh, like, oh. yeah, like, oh, why not? What the heck, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I'm here anyway, let's do it. And I'm leaning in and I'm telling you, Stu, I gave probably the worst talk of my life because I have completely forgotten what it's yeah. like to be a 15 year old boy. <laughs> These <laughs> yeah. guys were like, Oh, who, what, who is this person? What is she doing? But I finally in the last few minutes kind of wrapped my head around it and, and gave them, I think something that was useful. Yeah. And I stuck around to watch their game that afternoon. Hmm. And I, I remember watching this 15 year old boy and they, they're playing their hearts out. And I'm like, this is, they're actually doing it. Like I'm watching them put into practice yeah. immediately the stuff that I had just taught them. So cool. And he comes off the bench with like three minutes left and they're up by eight and he catches my eye. He finds me in the stand, catches my eye and just mouths to me. Thank you. 
And I just oh, lost man. my mind. I mean, I was like just bawling in the stands because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. that right there, yeah. that is why I do what I do. Like that, that kid, I mean, I suspect he's going to play in the NBA one day. He's dunking Let's at 15, go. you know, yeah. <laughs> this kid's good. <laughs> Jeez, but like, yeah. if nothing else, he's, he's going to start influencing the people around him in a way that creates a ripple effect. And, and to me, that's, that's, yeah. that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. That's amazing. I got full body goosebumps when you, when you, ah, yeah, that story. I know, that's, I know. That, that is so cool. <laughs> so, um, this has been an absolute joy, Rebecca, to, to pick your brain and dive through your life. And, um, I'm curious for our listener if they're going, man, I need more of Rebecca in my life. I need to hang out with this lady. She's awesome. Uh, where's <laughs> the best place they can find you? Check out your book and, and kind of just spend more time in your world. Yeah. I mean, a couple of spots. Uh, if you go to RebeccaHeist.com, um, you can find all the things. So that's where you can book me to speak. That is where you can find my courses. So there's an entire year's worth of this kind of content to walk you through the fearless year. Um, if you just want to hang out and check on what I'm doing, I'm pretty active on Instagram and LinkedIn. So you can find me at Dr. Rebecca Heiss, Heck H-E-I-S-S. Yeah. Um, and just drop a message, say, hey, and see if I can do what I can do to help you out. Let's go. I love it. So last question I have for you. Um, we ask this to all of our guests because we want to help our listener find direction but we believe in doing it through yeah. action is what would you say love is it. one thing our listener could do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction? Wow. That's such a good question. Um, do something fearless. Hmm. And, and I, I, I want to preface this by saying, um, that, you know, don't be fearless. Fearless is dumb. Fearless is jumping into the cage of the hungry tiger, right? Like <laughs> that's, that's reckless. That's not fearless. Fearing yeah. less. I put parentheses around the less because fearing less allows you to do more. So yeah. if you're feeling that, that like tension of, is this what I want to do? Is this what I want to do? Um, my ask of you is to close your eyes and just imagine that it's already been done. Imagine that it's already happened and just notice what happens to your body. Like, do your muscles relax? Do you breathe a sigh of relief? Or do you actually feel just as tense, right? And yeah. then try a different decision. Try this visualization a couple times with different directions because our bodies are Love really that. intuitive, right? They really do know and, and want to help us guide us towards the, the decisions that we need to be making. Yeah. Um, but, you know, imagine the best thing that could happen if you were fearing less and just let your body be your guide. Mm, I love that. That's a, a beautiful, beautiful exercise. Well, um, Rebecca, thank you again so much for being here. It's been an absolute joy and uh, we appreciate you greatly. So thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Stu. This has been fun. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Congratulations, my friend, on crushing it through another episode here on Finding Direction. Make sure you give yourself a pat on the back, a round of applause, because you are one of the few who is not willing to settle for less than a life that lights up your soul, and that is absolutely something worth celebrating. I hope you took something from that conversation with Dr. Rebecca, and more importantly, as always, I hope you take something and start applying it into your life, even if you just take that last exercise she spoke about, and just over the next three hours, next 12 hours, but before your head hits the pillow, walk yourself through that exercise and it's going to be massively impactful in your life. So other than that, have a wonderful, incredible, outstanding rest of your day. You know, I appreciate you. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would encourage you just share it on your social media, right? Let people know, Hey, this is what you got and learned about stress. And I promise you someone who sees it, it is going to help them as well. So thank you so much, my friend, have an outstanding rest of your day and I will talk to you soon. Take care.